Thank you for joining us today at Fairwinds Energy Education. Today's video guest is Spencer Smith, and we're here to talk about Voices from Chernobyl. Spencer received her MFA in writing from Vermont College. She's published fiction, two plays, and a novel, Depth of Field. In New York City, she worked as a writer-producer in corporate television. And currently, Spencer is writing a memoir of her experiences as a U.S. Peace Corps volunteer in Ukraine from 2001 to 2003. She has returned for visits to Ukraine in 2006, 2009, and plans to visit again this June. Spencer also taught creative writing, fiction, screenplays, memoir, at American colleges and universities, as well as in the Ukraine and on a Fulbright in Belarus, Russia. Spencer, thank you for joining us oh, today. Thank you for inviting me. It's good to be here. It's good to have you here. Um, how did you first become interested in Chernobyl? Well, I remember uh, the disaster in 1986. I remember there was a question of what was going on because the Swedes were picking up uh, radioactive signals and they thought it was one of their reactors and then soon after, of course, the Soviets were trying to keep it totally quiet. They thought they could do that for some reason. <laughs> and uh, so, unfortunately, because they didn't tell the world, a lot of people were exposed. I know that uh, the family I lived with during Peace Corps training in western Ukraine, I remember not the first time I was there, but when I went back later for a visit, the, the young wife, I mean, of the family, she's, her mother is my age, uh, said, you know, my mother and I were out in the radioactive rain. We never told anyone. And, of course, she had a child later who, thankfully, is, is fine. But another friend of mine was in Germany, and she uh, was pregnant, nine, eight or nine months pregnant, with twins. And uh, she was very upset, of course, because they got a very heavy... She was out working in her garden all day when it was raining. So I kind of, you know, over the years, I picked up bits. Now, when I was in Ukraine the first time in 01 to 03, nobody wanted to talk about Chernobyl. Um, of course, the Peace Corps did. <laughs> they told us not to go swimming, not to eat, eat wild berries or wild mushrooms, not to drink the water, uh, you know, all kinds of precautions. So there were other problems, of course. There's other, a lot, there was a lot of other industrial pollution besides Chernobyl, but that was, of course, the worst. Um, so, and now, of course, uh, there's a renewed interest in having nuclear reactors in Ukraine. They're so trying to build new ones yes, now? Yes, yes, because of their energy problems. You know, they want to get away from yeah, natural gas. <laughs> and, and so, well, it's all over Europe. I mean, uh, the French, of course, are going ahead. They, they believe, in, believe it's clean. I saw a, a portion of an interview last night where they said, well, it's some spokesman saying, well, at least we have clean energy here in France, which is, I don't know, what you would know this, what percent um, nuclear power they are. I think, I think we're at around 19 percent. In this country? Yeah, and I think France is higher than that, but I, I don't remember off the top of my head yeah. because they're having trouble with some of their reactors now. Well. Wow. Uh, they have a lot of pollution. Um, they've leaked a lot hmm. of radiation from the reprocessing system, yeah. which doesn't work correctly. And then what's left, all, they don't know what to do with all hmm. that waste, and they're dumping it in Siberia. So their whole system doesn't work, and now... Now, this is the French are dumping the it French, in Siberia. The French are dumping oh, it, lucky what they were supposed to <laughs> re reprocess. And well, the, it, it's, a, it's a bad news everywhere. Um, now... Um, you asked about Chernobyl and what I knew about it and right. when I was there. And, and when I got back, uh, this book came out in 1997 in, in Russian. Uh, it has a different uh, Molitva Chernobyskaya, which means the prayer of Chernobyl, but the English translation, Voices from Chernobyl, by Svetlana Alexievich, a very uh, well-known Russian or Soviet journalist, except she's exiled, not exiled, but she left for her own safety. Um, 
So there. did you ever meet her? I never met her, but I was so taken with this book when it got translated in, I guess it was in 05, and I saw it in 06. I guess it was just before or just after a visit back to, to Ukraine. And so then I became involved in the um, Vermont Yankee Decommissioning Alliance when I was living in Montpelier. That was sort of the core of it at that time. And it was getting to be either end of March or early April. And I said, well, you know, the Chernobyl anniversary will be uh, next month. I think it was going to be the 21st anniversary. And I said, we should do something, you know, to get people's attention. And so uh, everybody said, yeah, that's a great idea. What will we do? Well, I had just read this book, and I thought, maybe I could make a reader's play out of that. It's a good solution for <laughs> you as a, as a screenwriter. Yeah, well, I had written, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and so um, I did it in a couple of days, really. I created a narrator, and then I took six characters from the book. There are actually 100 characters in the book. Uh, but I took six plus created a narrator to sort of hold things together. And uh, it worked very well, and we did it first twice in Montpelier, and then we did it We did it in Burlington and that's, Shelburne. That's when I first met you, was okay. the very first performance in Burlington. Okay. And That was the one maybe at Burlington College, or was it at uh, the UU Church? Uh, we, I, we did both I, saw, I saw both places. You saw both those, okay. So, and I was so struck uh, and, and just touched and... Um, it's tearful and it's so emotional and it I, I felt so badly for the people you know well it's it's you know it w it's great because the people are telling their story in their right. own words she's a very skillful interviewer obviously and then instead of having her questions in there it's just presented as monologues by these people and their stories and so I picked a variety I have an illiterate peasant woman I have the wife of a firefighter who died a couple of weeks afterwards because they were sent with no protection to the site. Yeah. Uh, then I had the head of the Belarusian, uh, I guess, I don't know, nuclear, anyway, the top scientists in Belarus. Rus. I like that character a lot. And uh, there were, and there's another scientist who came in later who talked about how like 250,000 soldiers were sacrificed to the disaster. And of course still, they're trying to enclose the thing because it's still releasing t tons of radi radioactive material. And, you know, they don't have the money for it. And right. Europe has been pouring a lot of money, billions, into this. And still well, it's not everyone's secure. backed off. And my understanding is that by 2018, they, they, that sarcophagus has to be resealed. But there are currently there's no funds available to do it. Um, and as we look at this, I mean, the, the 30th anniversary mm -hmm. of this tragedy and w this melt full yeah. meltdown will yeah. be in um, 2016, yeah, next, next year. Just next year. So I, th I think yeah. it's really mindful that we talk about this. I was touched. Well, there's also a thing that you, I think we talked about it where, you know, there, there wasn't a lot of forest in that area. Uh, there were forested parts, but mostly it was farmland and, and uh, people, there were some small towns there. But since it's been abandoned, it had, people could no longer live safely there. The forests have grown up and now there are forest fires there. And so all that contaminated material is burning and sending radiation. We've talked about that on our website and I've uh, and, uh, done some uh, uh, tweets on, on yeah. our Twitter feed yeah. because yeah. it's just devastating that that is happening again and, and and we'll have a link up there to that material when this video is on the site. I was especially touched by by the character you mentioned earlier mm -hmm. from Belarus, the mm -hmm. scientist. Most of them were from Belarus because even though it happened in Ukraine, it was right on the border of Belarus and the wind blew, blew. most of the radiation north into Belarus. There's a joke when I was in Belarus later, the, the president said, well, the ra we, we weren't uh, radiated in Minsk because when the, the cloud came north, it, it parted around Minsk. <laughs> you know, mm. like, oh, well, it's Soviet humor. Well, as our <laughs> viewers on Fairwinds Energy Education know, um, we just finished a whole lot of material on Three Mile Island. Ah, yes. And one of the things people who were at Three Mile Island talk about, which the scientists in Belarus spoke about, in, in mm -hmm. your play is the metallic taste and the mm. s quiet that all the birds stop, there's yeah. no sound, and, and what that meant. And the plume issues was something that we talked about as well mm -hmm. with um, 
Dr. Ignis Ver Vergeiner moved up um, the river by Three Mile Island. He studied everything. And the plume moved right up along the river and mm. followed certain paths. And that's the same thing you're saying here. The, the plume goes where it goes by mm -hmm. the meteorology. Right. And that wasn't fully studied at Three Mile Island. His testimony was mm. excluded. And you have, as you're saying, some people claiming, oh, it never hit us in Minx because it went around us, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and you have what happened in Japan with mm. Fukushima Daiichi in that people were evacuated into the plume because the meteorologists <sighs> didn't play a role in, in that process. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess if the plume had gone in a slightly different direction, they would have had to evacuate Tokyo. I mean, yes, that's true. <laughs> which is that's true. Incredible to think. Just think it's of New York. Well, of course, we have a, a plant just 40 miles north of New York City. Right, the Indian Point plant. Yeah. And the evacuation there's plan no way will, to will, will, no, there's no, no way, way to evacuate. Yeah, it's no. hopeless. Yeah. It's hopeless. Yeah. So this is um, a really fine book. I recommend it, uh, the original uh, that the play is taken from. And the play, I guess, will be also posted in text form. You have a, a, an audio version, but also in text form. If people want to perform the play, they can download it. Okay, that would be, and, uh, that'll have, be terrific. And have a community reading. So that was one of my questions for you. How, who should they con connect with? Should they write? Do they have to write for permission or can they? No, we w I posted at the top of the text that I sent to you that uh, anybody can perform this play as long as they don't charge admission. Good. And Good. you're allowed to charge a small don you know, not charge, but ask for a small donation just to help if you have to rent a space to do it or something like That's that. That's wonderful. But, yeah. It's wonderful. And it was the Dalkey Archive Press that actually did the American version, and uh, we, we had a lawyer in our group, <laughs> who Ben Scotch, who uh, contacted them, and they said that these were the terms we could use it, if we weren't making money from it. That's wonderful. I, yeah. f I feel that's really important. Um, you said you're still in touch with many of the people there, and you're going back in June. What are you going to be doing in June when you're back there? Well, I'm going to visit with my friends, who I know, and I may be giving, uh, do some readings of my writing uh, in local libraries. Um, my friend, the uh, Dean of Foreign Languages at the University, uh, is making it possible for me to stay there free, so I want to, and of course, buy and I can eat. I was there for a month, I guess, in 09, and I think I spent $100 the whole month. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> save money by <laughs> going there. Uh, but, I mean, that's not the point. But, uh, yeah, so I'll, visit with friends and 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 then uh, after i'm there for about three weeks i'll probably go to sweden and see friends that i've known since high school days uh in sweden and sort of recover <laughs> from <laughs> what i saw in ukraine i mean i'm it's sobering yeah it's it's very upsetting because of the because of the disaster this terrible war that uh the russians putin has pushed uh, and and they're very anxious because he's already taken crimea if anybody can Probably now people have seen a, a map of Ukraine and have a sense that Crimea is this peninsula off the southern part of Ukraine. And they've, the Russians through these separatists, but it's really a Russian-led thing, are working through the east and they want to come right along the south and take the whole south. Because they, they also want the city eventually where I will be going to Nikolaev because it was their only warm water shipbuilding center. Oh. The other one is in Murmansk, which is inside the Arctic Circle. So. Well, all of the, the war and, and um, the fact that there isn't money to cover the sarcophagus, the, the concrete is deteriorating mm -hmm. and, and they need to do that. With all of that in mind, what's it like for people living there? What's the financial situation? Can you tell our, our viewers that? Well, it's very hard for the average person. Um, it's uh, because if you think about the fact, I was there when I was first there, in, in, well, I left in 03 after being there two years. The exchange rate was five to one. Uh, one dollar would get you five grieving. When I went back in 09, it was 10 to one. It's now about 25 to 35, it fluctuates to one. Wow. And their pensions and their salaries are not going up. And I ta my friend the dean said that what's happening is there's this tremendous um, energy for or civic uh, rebuilding of the country, but it's all, as he put it, horizontal. In other words, you have this corrupt elite and these oligarchs who've been controlling everything. 
and how to break that pattern. Plus, apparently, uh, the KGB from Russia had infiltrated a great deal of the army and also the uh, intelligence service in Ukraine. It's mm -hmm. a hard thing. There's this long history of Ukraine and Russia together, but it's parts of it have been never, hardly ever part of Russia and part in the West and the, the East was a part of Russia from about uh, 1800 on. Hmm. Yeah. I just saw a video today, a television video, of a young um, woman, she's in her early 20s, who's running in a half marathon in Kansas City. Hmm. And she is a child of the Chernobyl disaster. Uh -huh. And um, a group of doctors originally brought her to the U.S. Oh, there's been a whole program of doing that with children. Yes. Yeah. Well, she has no, her, her legs stop at her knees. Mm. And she ha and, and they have, the doctors mm -hmm. have made her prosthetic legs and mm. um, she has no feet. And so she's learned to run and she's missing many fingers on her hands from the impact of Chernobyl, the radiation exposure that her mom was, ex you know, Received. There's so many children that, and uh, yeah, horrendously. She's still in touch with her own family, mm. but they had put her in a special school that was to try and help her because she couldn't get along in a regular system. Yeah. But doctors, U.S. doctors, came, you know, went to those areas mm -hmm. um, and proceeded to look at different children that they could help surgically and mm -hmm. bring them here. And so she, she yeah. spent seven or eight summers here and mm -hmm. really learned a lot she and she went ended up the hmm. host families three host families sponsored her to do to take university hmm. here so she's graduated from yeah. college and she's now living hmm. in Kansas City and she's running in this that's, that's half great. marathon and she said was she's, she from Belarus or Ukraine do you know it didn't it said Ukraine that's said all Ukraine. Saying, yeah. but it, but I don't know yeah, any yeah. closer than that it was yeah. you know a, um, a regular channel media of news you know story. when I was in Belarus um, there is a huge cancer hospital on the outskirts of Belarus you have to go by bus forever I guess they don't want people to see it basically <laughs> and I went out there because I had some little growth on my eye and this local doctor thought oh you probably have cancer you go out there and this woman, woman there and this doctor said oh we could cut that out tomorrow for you I, said, oh, I think I'll wait till I get home you <laughs> know of course it disappeared <laughs> on its own but um, but there were a lot of, it, it was a pretty depressing looking place. And there were some, but there were some vans there that were clearly from other countries who take children. And I can't remember the countries now. There were several countries in Western Europe that also had taken children every summer to yeah. get them out of the radiation because right. the radiation is still there in Belarus. Well, that's happening currently. Mm. A lot of children are take, from Japan are taken to other mm. places in the world to help them because That's there's good. so much radiation in yeah. Fukushima prefecture. Yeah, yeah. It, it's challenging. Um, hmm. After researching, I have a m couple more questions for you. After researching uh, this material and mm -hmm. writing the reader's play, what are your opinions about nuclear power? Oh, well, I think it's pretty evident. I think it's a big mistake. I mean, it's the, the whole idea of uh, it was just a bad idea to split the atom. I mean, it was only done for military purposes. And then they had all this stuff laying around. What are we going to do with this? Ah, oh, we could boil water with this. <laughs> I know. Einstein right. said it was the worst idea for boiling water, <laughs> you know, ever. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about what's happened at Vermont Yankee now? Because you said you were involved with Vermont decommit yeah. uh, decommissioning Yeah, well, you know, I, I know that they were uh, ordered to shut down and they're mm -hmm. not producing uh, heat, not producing electricity anymore. But the thing is still there, and I'm sure it's, there were a lot of things that needed to be repaired before they shut down, which may be causing problems. And you're probably more up on that than I am. But you did mention, uh, maybe you could say a little more about it, about the, um, uh, the need to... Um, what was it? You were well, it's about important. That. Yeah. It, it's really important for our viewers and listeners to understand that the federal government is trying to make changes to the decommissioning policy. Mm, yeah. And they're trying to make sure that communities have to keep the waste and mm. are responsible for further cleanup if the utilities and energy companies don't. And that's just not 
what the communities or the states took on. Yeah. These companies have made a lot of money and they yeah. should be fully responsible for the cost of decommissioning and an entire cleanup. The statute, the Federal Code of mm -hmm. Regulations, is clear. So the, the, you know, the, a, the law is clear. The law is clear. It's Code of well, Federal Regulations. Well, there needs Regulations. to be a lawsuit, There's perhaps. I don't know. Is the state thinking about uh, I don't know. a suit? That I don't know. Uh, we mm. have done a really involved study and submitted it to the NRC in the yeah. state. We had a Lintelac Foundation grant to do that, and we've spent a year doing that. And it's just terrifying now, as, as all different groups, the state of Vermont yeah. submitted materials, we submitted materials, different um, interveners all around the country have submitted materials because seven plants are being de decommissioned now in the U.S. And as those yeah. were being submitted to the NRC yeah. for their rulemaking, hmm. they have not put those on the website, their website at all. Hmm. They're not allowing everyone to see what the comments were. And behind the scenes, they're working hmm. with the industry to change the rule to help the industry. So it's it's pretty frightening. Yeah. Um, it's pretty immoral. Yeah, I think it's immoral too. <laughs> yeah. Um, I could read you this short quote from Svetlana Alexievich. Oh, I'd love that. Yeah. I'd love that. And um, this is the woman who wrote the book and is such a dedicated journalist and, and really put her own life in danger to go into the, the zones to, to interview people. She said, if you look back at the whole of our history, both Soviet and post-Soviet, remember she was a Soviet journalist, it is a huge common grave and a bloodbath, an eternal dialogue of the executioners and the victims, the accursed Russian questions, what is to be done and who is to blame? The revolution, the gulags, the Second World War, the Soviet-Afghan war hidden from the people, the downfall of the great empire, the downfall of the giant socialist land, the land utopia, and now a challenge of cosmic dimensions, Chernobyl. This is a challenge for all the living things on Earth such as our history. And this is the theme of my books. This is my path, my circles of hell. Heavy stuff. Very heavy stuff. Yeah. Spencer, thank you for sharing that mm. quote, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for you know, inviting me. I really me. appreciate it's having great you. Having a visit. In closing, I, I want to ask our viewers to please look at this material on our site. We've done a retrospective and commemorative piece on Fukushima Daiichi. We've also done two huge pages and, and given you lots of material to read about Three Mile Island. And now Spencer was kind enough to join us today and talk to you about Chernobyl. And, and she's been there and met with Ukrainians and, and knows firsthand. She's written a beautiful reader's play that I hope you'll listen to. It's up on our site. And I hope you work with us to find a more sustainable energy future. Yeah.